Hello and welcome to the Capital Games Movie Club. I am The Wiz. Alright, well this week we are discussing the 2005 murder mystery comedy Kiss Kiss Bang Bang starring Robert Downey Jr., Val Kilmer, and Michelle Monaghan directed by Shane Black. We're doing Christmas movies this week, uh, this month, and apparently according to Entertainment Weekly, this counts. So I'm going to bend the rules just like everyone else does and finally get to watch a movie I've been really wanting to watch for a while. Uh, those of you who maybe are really into film may not know who Shane Black is. Uh, Shane Black is, got into the the industry, the film industry by writing the Lethal Weapon movies. He's, he wrote all four. Uh, and he started going into directing in around 2005 with, I think, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was his first directed movie. If I So he's been doing uh, directing for a, a little while at this point. And the thing with Shane Black is he, he does have his tropes. Like, a lot of his movies are set in Christmas. They're usually buddy comedies. They're, they're action movies. But what sets him apart from other writers and directors, well, writers specifically, when it comes to action movies, are the fact that the, the writing, the dialogue, is actually very punchy, very funny, and very quick-witted. So you got a lot of different characters who speak in a very acerbic, in a, with acerbic wit. And it leads to some really good, really memorable pairings. So uh, you have, of course, Lethal Weapon. Uh, we have The Long Kiss Goodnight, which is another one he wrote. I didn't realize this, but he also wrote Last Action Hero, the the spoof of uh, 90s action films, which uh, back when it was released got lambasted, but uh, has turned into, I would say, a, a cult hit to a certain extent. It's got a fan base. I, I, I like it myself, so... There's that, at least. Shane Black was more known as a writer until 2005 when he wrote wrote and decided to direct this movie, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, he's written and directed other movies. Uh, he directed Iron Man 3, which is actually... Uh, and, he, and he wrote it, too, which is actually a pretty good Iron Man movie, also set in Christmas. And he also... Uh, one I will definitely recommend is The Nice Guys, the 2016 movie starring uh, Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, it's very good. It, it's it's a lot of fun. It's got a it's got great performances by the leads, and Angeline Rice, is it Angeline or Angeline? I, I, I can't get her name right, but uh, she plays a, the daughter of, uh, I think it was Ryan Gosling in the movie, and she is very funny in it as well. If you end up wanting to watch more buddy cop or buddy action movies, The Nice Guys is also a very good one. But we're going to talk Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, starring Robert Downey Jr., Val Kilmer, and Michelle Moynihan, and directed by Shane Black. I've wanted to watch this movie for a while, but it's it's always one of those things where... You know, like, oh, I'm interested, but there's other things that I, I kind of want to check out. So I'll get to that when I get to it. And then, you know, 15, 16 years later, here I am. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, when it came out, got pretty good critical reception, but didn't do well in the box office. And this, this is what kind of led people to think at the time that maybe Robert Downey Jr. is kind of done as a lead actor i mean to be fair also uh, robert downey jr had his issues he had his drug issues he had a, a lot of legal problems so that definitely hurt him but he was trying to get back into hollywood movies and this didn't do so hot uh sales wise so people started thinking you know maybe his time's done and then of course he did iron man and jumpstarted the whole MCU, so they were wrong. Anyway, so Robert Downey Jr. plays a thief who, while trying to basically 
uh, run from the cops after a score has gone wrong. He finds himself accidentally being casted to be in a movie for a potential movie role. And he is sent to Hollywood after to train under a private eye named Gay Perry, played by Val Kilmer. And the basics of the story, it's set on Robert Downey Jr.'s Harry uh, character, who's the thief in this movie. And him going through a pretty a pretty darkly comic uh, crime drama, like a crime scenario in this with uh with Gay Perry who is the guy who is training him for the role. And the the strength of the movie lies solely on these two and how they coexist. By far the best written character in this movie is Gay Perry. He has some of the funniest lines and uh, Kilmer plays that character incredibly well. He he fits that character to a T like constantly the the lines are funny the way he uh the the way he says the lines are spot on and robert downey jr with his comedic chops uh really falls into it very well when it comes to going through the comedic bits that these two get into it's funny uh, robert downey jr usually isn't what you would call the straight man in most movies which is the guy who the, the craziness bounces off of and he just reacts, but he, he kind of is in this movie. And it's because of the two characters that surrounds him, which is Val Kilmer's, Kilmer's Gay Perry and uh, Michelle Monaghan's character, uh, Harmony. And Michelle Monaghan's actually very good in this, too. She plays the... Eh, I don't think femme fatale is a right terminology, but she's definitely, she's definitely more interesting than that. But she is a... <laughs> she's actually pretty good in this performance too uh, and, and another very well written quick witted funny uh, character that's in the movie it's surprising uh, watching this movie and down and Robert Downey Jr.'s character is really not the the most quick witted person in this movie he's just generally reacting to everything that's going on which I, I think is, is a, a different way of uh, it's pretty different than what I'm used to seeing Robert Downey Jr. in. And he does a very good job playing the straight man in this. Like, usually when somebody who is usually the one that has all the quick lines, the snarkiness and everything, when they go straight man, it usually is pretty bad. But, again, Downey Jr. is a a very talented actor. So I guess it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. But it's definitely a, a very good performance on his part when it comes to playing this character. Delving a little into the writing, uh, uh, but the, the highlight of the movie isn't the crime, the crime caper, which usually is in these types of movies. Uh, this is a, a dark noir slash black comedy, and the, the black comedy comes with the, the funny situations that happens revolving around all these dark and macabre things happening. The, the crime caper is interesting, but it's really a backseat to the comedy and to the relationships between the three characters. And I think it's to its strength. It, it's They definitely are interesting uh, characters to sit through when you're watching the movie. I mean, these are, again, they're written very well. They're, they're also very funny in a lot of the movie. So I I definitely really enjoyed watch, like sitting through the movie. There's really not a boring part to this movie either. The way that the way the movie's paced and every how everything goes through the movie is very well done. Yeah, I sat uh, watching the movie and there really isn't a dull part in the movie or a slow part. It is constantly feeding you uh, really good lines, some some good comedy, some interesting t tidbits throughout. So it, it keeps up its pace very well. It's been a hundred minutes, and it, it's a it's really an inter not interesting, but it's a very entertaining movie for what it is. A, a very entertaining movie. Shane Black's direction is pre is is good. 
Not great, though. I mean, but to be fair, Shane Black's uh, Shane Black as a director uh, is fairly rudimentary. Rudimentary. He he doesn't do anything flashy. He sets the scene very well. He has a uh, a very standard way of shooting. Nothing too extravagant. Like just do the lines, shoot the way it is, and just make the stars and the writing the star of the movie and what to pay attention to. And it works. There, there really is no need for any extravagant trickery or anything in this movie. So direction's good. It's not great, but, you know, it, it's it's serviceable. It's serviceable to the story, which is to just make the writing and the characters the central thing to pay attention to in the movie. It, it's very good. Okay, so my final thoughts for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is that basically, if you are into buddy buddy movies and crime capers and dark comedies and you haven't watched Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I think you owe it to yourself to do that. You probably have, if we're being fair. But Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I think, is a very good uh, comedy and, and a very entertaining movie. Uh, the performances are great. I think Val Kilmer uh, is the best part of this movie uh, and his character, and he plays that really well. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is pretty good in it. Michelle Monaghan is very good. The supporting characters are great, but the writing is the, is the real star in this movie and the dialogue uh, that keeps the movie funny and engaging with its quips and its really good dialogue. I really enjoyed the writing in this movie directing is fine it's fairly serviceable so but that's not the point the point is the great dialogue and the characters so yeah i will give this movie three and a half stars you know what no no i'll give it four stars it's a it's a it's a very good four star movie it is very entertaining and I think I would prefer this over any of the Lethal Weapons or even the Nice Guys. And I really like the Nice Guys. So if you haven't seen it and you like those movies, I think you owe it to yourself to watch Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. So give this definitely give this movie a shot. It's a four-star movie. I really enjoyed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And if you haven't watched it, I'd say give it a shot. I think you owe it to yourself to do that if you're into these movies. All right, so let's get into some topics here. Uh, last week, I discussed the announced uh, list from Sight & Sound, the, the top 100 films of all time. Went into some detail about what won, what, what was listed, and my thoughts on the list. Again, I... Uh, I don't mind the list. I thought it was interesting, and uh, I, I won't rehash that. But uh, I, I want to go and do something here that's been going on on Twitter and Facebook that a lot of people are doing, and that, and that is basically if I was asked to compile a list for the Sight & Sound Top 100, what would I choose? So I'm going to go through... Uh, 10 films I think deserved to be on that list uh, that I think if I were given the chance that I would put on the list. These aren't necessarily my all-time favorite movie movies. I think they're excellent movies, but I think these are the ones that are most deserving. So here here's here I go right now. The first one I want to point out point out is Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Now, it's already on the list. I think it's number 76 on the Sight & Sound 100. When it comes to animated movies, uh, Spirited Away is the watermark. It, it, it is the bar that you have to reach in order to become the best. Uh, Spirited Away is not only a beautiful-looking film, but it, it is also a film literally for everybody if they were to give it a chance it is an epic movie with some decent with some good action in it it is a deep and thoughtful movie for people who want uh, things to think about and to feel it is also utterly gorgeous it is imaginative when it comes to just pure amount of imagination and this and the quality of the animation itself 
I think nothing beats Spirit Away. And nothing has in the past 20 years since it's been released. If there has to be, there should be more animated movies, I think, on this list. And I think that's like a, a, a oversight for to the critics uh, when it comes to the the Sight and Sound 100. Spirit Away is definitely one that deserves to be considered not only one of the best animated movies of all time, but one of the best movies of all time. And it, compare it to either hand-drawn or computer animated, nothing beats this movie. It is a fantastic movie. The next movie that I would uh, I would put in there is Her, or the Spike Jones movie from 2013 starring Joaquin Phoenix. Her does so many things right. The, the, the conceit of Her is that a man falls in love with an AI. Uh, when you hear a man falling in love with a computer or an AI, you would think of it as like a, like a comedy, like a, about a, a desperately lonely loser who is ripe for ribbing, or just a lurid sex comedy where a guy sticks his penis into a 3x5 floppy disk drive or something stupid like that. But no, it's actually a a heartfelt and sensitive portray, uh, portrayal of finding love in an, unexpe- in an unexpected place. And the movie does a fantastic job, not only making you empathize with the main character, but also to be non-judgmental about what is going on with this character and the, the emotions he's feeling and why maybe that isn't so crazy after all in that aspect and if it did just that okay i mean that's that's good that's it did its intended purpose but then her goes another step and goes into the questions about what ai and computers have to do with our life and the effects it will have on our life and things like that and then it goes another step further with uh other issues and other questions it's asking that I won't spoil if you haven't seen her. Her is is a rare film that not only does its intended purpose correctly and an intended purpose that is very hard to do, but it goes several steps above that and nails those on top just in the audacity, not only in just tackling that kind of, uh, so not the subject matter, but that kind of story with a, a sensitivity and realism, not realism, a sensitivity and warmth that isn't something that was teasing the character, but also to delve into more of the deeper uh, aspects of not only love, but computers. Uh, it is a special movie that I full heartedly recommend to anybody who hasn't seen it. it it is it is a lovely film it is fantastic i adore her for not only portraying the character so sensitively but also taking the concept and going several steps above what most films would and succeeding uh, her right right there i think is probably one of the best written movies ever made Fargo is the next one, the 1996 crime caper star, well, not crime caper, but the 1996 dark comedy uh, starring Francis McDormand, William H. Macy, and Stevie Shemmy, directed by the Coens. Fargo has always been a favorite of mine. I've, I've loved Fargo for a long time. One of the interesting things that I remember watching Fargo is that they made they made it uh, apparent in the beginning of the movie that this movie is based on a true story, and when you watch it, the movie is darkly comic in a I would say a, not a strange way, but in a way that stretches credulity. But the movie is deftly done so well that you still believe. That, wow, this really happened. That's crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so crazy that it happened that way. Until you realize later on when you watch the movie that, no, the, the directors flat out lied. <laughs> it's not based on a true story at all. And, and that's the brilliance of Fargo to a certain extent, where the, the movie straight up lies to you. And even though it's lying to you, you believe the lie. And then when it's told, when it's told to you that the, 
that you were lied to, it doesn't matter because there's still a way that you can believe it to a, cer- a, cer- a certain extent. The the blend of dark comedy and uh, homespun Minnesotan charm is a blend that only, I think, the Coens could actually make work very well. I mean, Fargo is both Hollywood and independent uh, to a certain extent. Uh, it's Hollywood in the way that a pregnant cop is uh, taking down bad guys, and it's independent because it's done in that Minnesotan drawl and with a, a fairly dark plot line in there as well. Uh, Fargo defies, defies convention and uses it in really interesting twists and turns that even when you know what's happening, it's still not only very entertaining, but it also very thought-provoking. Uh, Fargo will always be a favorite of mine, and I know for a lot of people it's a, a favorite of theirs too, but Fargo, I think, should have also been on the top 100. Uh, what was in the top 100 was Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive's interesting. I've seen this film seven or eight times, and I, I, I gotta tell you, I still don't really know what the movie's about. I have theories. I have ideas as to what it might be about. But that's what's interesting about David Lynch. Okay, he's one of the few directors where you're not sure what the hell is going on, but because it's so beautiful to watch, and it's so confusing, that it's also fascinating to sit through. It's not fair to call Mulholland Drive a mood piece, because you don't even know what the mood is supposed to be in this movie. But even then, it is one of these films that obfuscation is really the only thing in the film that I think is a constant. And usually that frustrates people. uh, Because if you feel like you're not getting the whole story and you're missing something or you're being lied to or whatever, it generally is a frustrating thing to deal with. But to be given, like, puzzles after puzzles in this in this movie but with how well it's shot and beautifully it's done you don't mind that the movie is fucking with your head and i go back to it often uh again i've seen like seven or eight times and i still am amazed by how it's shot and what they do and and what lynch does in the movie i thoroughly enjoy mulholland drive and even though I, I will admit to this day, I'm still not sure what it's about, but I think I will probably spend most of my life trying to figure it out and have no problem doing it. Godfather Part 2 is my next one. Godfather Part 1 is in the list. Uh, Godfather Part 2 got kicked uh, from from the 2022 list. Godfather 1 is a Stone Cold classic, and it deserves its praise for its great performances, its perfectly flung plot and it's really quotable dialogue that really has changed mafia movies ever since it was made but godfather part two does all that and one more and it, and it weaves two conflicting stories that folds in its into itself to make one of the best movies about the father-son dynamic and this is a very tough thing to do. There are ensemble movies, okay, that, that people make movies uh, with, like, 10, 15, 20 different characters. Well, that might be too much, but with a lot of characters. And something falls by the wayside. Something doesn't work and, and stuff like that. Godfather Part Two we- weaves both stories, one about Vito and one about Michael, so well that... These are if you were to make these two move these two stories into movies themselves, they would be great movies, okay? But because they're woven so well into one, it makes it absolutely outstanding. And as much as I do love the first Godfather, the second one is really one of the best films ever made. It it, it is it does one thing that most ensemble movies or most films try to do and often 
doesn't succeed in doing, and that is weave re- two really good stories into one cohesive package, and nothing has done it better than The Godfather Part Two. Before Sunset is my next one. This is my favorite romance movie of all time. Would I recommend seeing the first film before Sunrise? Yes. Do you need to? No. I, I think to get the ultimate payoff of Before Sunset, you would have to watch Before Sunrise. And Before Sunrise is a very good movie. But Before Sunset deals with the topic of missed opportunities and second chances in the way that I, I don't think I'll ever see a movie do. And it does it in not only in like a, a sensitivity, but in a realism and in, a, in, a, in an adult realism. A lot of second chance movies and second opportunity movies do it in a sort of campy, kind of wishy-washy, you know, wish upon a star, it's a miracle type of storytelling. It, it takes a, a confounding amount of credulity to believe that it happened. And Before Sunset doesn't do that, really. Before Sunset makes you believe that, oh, this is just a, a chance that it happened. I can't, wow, this is something. That you can still believe it happens, and you can believe what happens in the end, and it's so damn satisfying when it does. It is hard for me to uh, really, it's not hard for me to recommend Before Sunset, period. Before Sunset is, uh, to me, the best romantic movie of all time. But it is hard for me to recommend it to somebody who hasn't seen Before Sunrise. I would have no problem doing it if you really don't want to watch the other movie, but to get the full effect, you need to see Before Sunrise. But but Before Sunset is probably the best sequel to a movie ever made. That, that is also including Godfather Part Two. Man, I'm, I'm going to piss off some people today. But yeah, Before Sunset is my next one. Come and see the 1985 uh, anti-war movie uh, directed by Ellen Klimoff. Come and see is a movie that is so good and so effective and brilliant as to what it does. I can't recommend anybody watching this movie because it will change you. I saw this movie five years ago and I still have scenes from this movie seared into my brain. It is purely devastating and it's nightmare inducing it's not nightmare inducing to where you see all sorts of twisted gory depraved and disgusting degenerate stuff like you would say i don't know a serbian film i'm not talking like that i'm talking about actual horror it is a beautiful i would call it a beautiful but destructive masterpiece Come and See is a story of a child soldier surviving the Nazi invasion of Belarus. I will tell you that when you're done, it will leave you as a shell of a person when you're done watching this movie. Yeah, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but it, it changes you. It comes close to traumatizing you to a certain extent because you're seeing these horrific things go on in this movie. And it's in the eyes of a child and it's not done in a way that is gratuitous or it's done just to shock you. There is a message in there, and the message is said very clearly. It also adds this pulpability when you realize it's done through the eyes of a child who's losing his innocence as the minutes tick when you're watching this movie. Hell, the actor himself changes physically <laughs> throughout the film. It, it is devastating to watch, and as beautiful and as brilliant as Come and See is, it is something that if I tell people it is one of the best war movies ever made, I also say, and you should not see it. It, it, is, it is devastating in its singularity. It is, it, yeah, it is something else to watch. But yeah, Come and See is my next one. Jackie Brown, I think Tarantino's best film. Tarantino, in his filmography has made films to mirror his love of film. Uh, and he mirror, and he shows it marrying his films with great visuals and really good dialogue. And he also gets really good performances from the, the actors that he uses. But Jackie Brown does something that Tarantino rarely does. 
And that is show restraint. When Tarantino made Jackie Brown, you can tell that what he has didn't need visual trickery or camera flourishes or or all sorts of like crazy types of gore or blood or or things like that to enhance the film. He knew he had a great film like right away when he had it with the the writers the writer well he was the writer but with the characters that he wrote in the movie and the actors that he had he knew he had an outstanding film and he just let it go now he does have some really good visuals in the movie but the fact that Tarantino wrote i think i think this this is his best film not only he wrote it very well that he just let the actors do the movie essentially just shows exactly how much of a good director he is. Because when he recognizes that he's got something special, that it doesn't need more tinkering or it doesn't need more to enhance the, what I would say that that would enhance the movie itself. Uh, he knew right then and there is, oh, okay, just let them play. And that's what he did. He let them play. He let them play with his dialogue, which is Tarantino's best strength. And he let them just do the movie with little embellishment. And it, it is it is literally his best film. I, I like Tarantino when he's bombastic. Jackie Brown is his best. E2 Mama Tambien is the next one. This is a film that I think as years go by gets less and less love. Uh, to a certain extent. And I, I don't really understand why. Well, I, I kind of do. Uh, let me let me just say this. When I first saw this film when I was 19, I just looked at it as a sex drama and that's it. I was like, okay, you know, it's a sex drama. There's some frank dialogue about sex. There is a, a good amount of nudity. Uh, there's some strong sexual content. Okay, it's a sex drama, whatever. Then I saw it again years later when I was older, like when I was like 28, 29. I appreciated the story of the boy, the, uh, how relatable the boy's relationship was in the movie and its complexity. And then around 35, 36, I watched it again. And then I appreciate the story of the woman in this movie and what she's going through and her crisis that she's going through. I watched it again about a year ago uh, for another podcast, and the political tidbits really grew on me and got and I started really uh, appreciating. Uh, Itu Mama Tambien is a film that constantly peels layers. Uh, the politics of sex, growing up, maturity, political strife, class strife. It's a film that constantly tells more stories than... The, the more that you watch it. That's the sign of a deeply well-thought film. Uh, uh, it, it is Afonso Cuaron's best. I know he's gone on to make other films. But to me, Itu Mama Tambien is a, a deep meditation on growing up and the things that happen when you do. And it, it's still something that moves me every time I watch it and I get something new out of it. It is an exceptional film that I think more people should give a chance to and deserves more people to champion in this. Maybe it's the sex that drives people away and the obscene language, but it is an exceptional, exceptional movie. And the last movie is Shoah. Shoah is already on the list, but I, I just want to point out Showa is too important of a film to be left out. To me, just a matter of importance, Showa should be number one in this. And, and Showa isn't, and I think the reason why it's not is because Showa is an eight hour documentary. Like eight hours. Showa does something that most documentaries about the Holocaust or about anything really doesn't reach, but Showa does it in the way. It's really hard to describe. Showa. When, when people tune into stories about the Holocaust and they watch stories about World War II, it's often about the bigger picture. What happened to the group? What happened to uh, the Nazis, the Allies, the Axis powers, the Jewish people? The, the, the main, they, they talk more about the, on, the, the conflict. Shoah makes it much more personal. Shoah is about time. 
Showa is about a people, a collective trauma. It's all encompassing. It's worldwide. It's deeply personal. It is, it is a conflicting uh, nature of the devastating effect of the Holocaust. M- most films about the Holocaust itself, it concentrates on the horrors, the tragedies, and the drama. But Showa does something different. It's about the details, the mundanity, the the inanity of the Holocaust and what happened. What and because of what Claude Landsman did in this movie, there is more power, drama, and emotion. Listening to a man while he's cutting hair describing what he went through than actually seeing it on screen. I can't explain it better than that, okay? If he were, if Claude Landsman were to have done an artist interpretation or shot a scene of that scene happening, it would have less power, less power than listening to this man struggle to talk about what he went through in a concentration camp. The movie also talks to people on the other side of the Nazis, uh, specifically of this person who praised the way the train system worked to get Jews into the concentration camps and how disturbing that that was to listen to. I mean, there is more power in this movie than I think uh, you would get by just visually representing it. And hearing these people uh, talking about their collective trauma and their complicity has a power to it that I think few movies could ever attain. Showa is not only a great movie, it's an important one, and it deserves to be on that list. And I'm glad it is. Showa, to me, is required viewing that requires your undivided attention, and we live in a society that just doesn't see the, the reason to devote eight hours of their life to something that will make you feel bad. But if you really want to understand... I think the collective trauma that happened at that time, I don't think sh- I don't think anything would beat Showa in that. So Showa is my 10th movie. My list, as I see it, Spirit Away, Her, Fargo, Mulholland Drive, The Godfather Part 2, Before Sunset, Come and See, Jackie Brown, Itu Mama Tambien, and Showa. Those are the 10 movies that if I had a list to give the Sight and Sound 100, that would be my top 10. All right, so we are at the end of the episode. Before I go, let us talk about some of the news that happened this week. Rumors are that uh, the DCEU is probably being rebooted. Now, this isn't too much of a surprise. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, James Gunn uh, is now uh, was now was named the uh, co-head of DC Studios, and he will be responsible for making the new DC cinematic universe, essentially. Right now, uh, this week, there was a lot of news coming coming around that it looks like the DCEU is essentially gutting the Snyderverse, which is the DCEU. Tuesday, it was announced that Patty Jenkins' Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman 3 is no longer moving forward. Like, that's done. It's over. They're, they're no longer doing Wonder Woman 3. Uh, they're citing creative differences. But from what it sounds like, uh, James Gunn is looking to reboot the entirety of the DC uh, DC movies. That's uh, unfortunate. I, I, well, you know, let's be fair here. Wonder Woman, the first one, was excellent. I think Wonder Woman is one of the best comic book movies ever made at this point. I think it's it's a top five for me, for sure. But 84 did not do very well. 84, a lot of people were not happy with 84 as well. So there was that problem. Also rumored is that uh, a sequel to Black Adam isn't happening. It didn't make enough money, which, okay. Like, I kind of expected that, but that sucks. There is no contract right now for Henry Cavill to return as Superman, even though he returned as Superman in Black Adam. For what it looks like now, Aquaman 2 will probably be the last DC movie. We have The Flash coming in June, and right now Aquaman 2 is coming 
December of next year, is what the timetable looks like right now. And if that's the case, I mean, that's that's really it, I guess. But here's what I'm seeing right now uh, that I think might happen. Here are the two scenarios I see going forward. One, whether it sells huge or not, The Flash will not get a sequel. Ezra Miller will not return, and the last Snyderverse movie, a DC movie, will be Aquaman 2, and they're just going to start over with an entire new universe. Which will also mean that all roles will be recast. That includes Superman, Harley Quinn, Wonder Woman, etc. Uh, the Batman will get its sequel. Uh, they've already uh, agreed to a sequel to The Batman, which is the, the Pattinson film, but that's it. They're going to reboot that as well when that scenario two is if the flash and aquaman 2 does so well they will have some sort of story as to why ezra miller and jason moe's character looks the same but the other characters don't maybe the flash tears a hole in the time space continuum that leads them into another multiverse or another space and time that has these heroes but they all look different uh, to a, a certain extent. They go forward from that. Either way, it, it looks like James Gunn is is re- rebooting the entire DC universe, is what it looks like. And what they're going to have to do, I think, is they're going to have to start with somebody other than Superman. Like, they, they need to do what I, I think the MCU did. Uh, MCU didn't start with its big guns. It didn't start with X-Men. It didn't start with Spider-Man. It didn't start with Captain America. It started with Iron Man. I'm going to make a bet here. I think they're going to start with Jon Stewart as the Green Lantern. It makes sense for a number of reasons. First, Hollywood's all about diversity quotas, and Jon Stewart is the Black Green Lantern, so that tracks. Jon Stewart's also a very light Green Lantern, so I don't think anybody will have an issue with Jon Stewart as the Green Lantern, especially with how many people hated the Hal Jordan one with Ryan Reynolds. So I, I think that that will happen, too. And uh, and honestly, a good Green Lantern movie would jumpstart the gun DC universe pretty quick. Like if there's a good Green Lantern movie after the disaster of the last one, uh, that will do wonders for the, the new DC universe. So... In my mind, it's that that's where I think it's going to head to. It's going to head to DC is going to reboot the entire thing. I, I, I think, honestly, I think regardless of the sales of The Flash and Aquaman 2, the Snyderverse is done. I mean, when you have a brand new set of creatives who want to make their mark they're going to scrap everything else that was there, regardless of how successful it was. And let's be fair, too. I think the the best two DC movies was Wonder Woman and The Suicide Squad, the James Gunn-directed one. Like, that was really good. But other than that, that's it. Man of Steel was okay. The the first Justice League sucked. Dawn of Justice was kind of bad. Like, this was... And they announced so many different DC projects that didn't go anywhere. It it probably is a good idea to just cut bait and move on. And I think the best way to do that is with uh, Jon Stewart as Green Lantern. But we'll see on that. Uh, James Gunn hasn't confirmed any of this. He said that some of it's right, some of it's wrong, some of it we're not sure yet. Which is really, he hasn't confirmed a damn thing. So... But I I will say this, the DC, if they're really going to do a a DC universe, a a DC film universe, which I I was really hoping they weren't going to do that, but if they are going to do it, they have to start with a bang. And I think John Williams' Green Lantern would probably be the best one you can go with. So we'll see. Uh, We'll see where that goes on that end. All right, so we are at the end of the episode. Before I go, why don't we get into what I am watching next week? Let's do an actual Christmas movie, (laughs) okay? I'm not going to cheat again. And you know what? I want to have some fun. It's Christmas after all. You know, it's Christmas. So I'm going to watch a set of movies that I 
personally really enjoy. <laughs> I, I like these movies. And whenever there's a new one, I try and go see them in the theaters, even though it makes me look like a complete fucking dork. But I tend to do that. But we're going to watch Muppet Christmas Carol, starring Michael Caine. I haven't seen this one. I've seen Muppet Treasure Island. I've seen Muppets Most Wanted, Muppets from Space, The Muppets. I've seen the other. I think this is the only one I haven't seen. All right, so join me next week where I'm reviewing and discussing Muppet Christmas Carol starring Michael Caine. I am The Wiz. This is the Capital Games Movie Club. Talk to you next week. Bye.